Hello, happy Monday. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Gaman Singh. Topping our newscast, Sunday was a dark day for the United States as it marked the deadliest mass shooting in the nation's history. A gunman entered a nightclub in Orlando frequented by the LGBT community and fired an assault rifle, leaving many dead. Virgin Islanders in the area share their experiences of the shooting. News 2's April Night has more. What is supposed to be the happiest place on earth is reeling from shock and grief. On Sunday morning, a gunman entered Pulse, a gay nightclub in Orlando, and opened fire, killing 50 people and injuring 53. Virgin Islander Tony Bon Jovi Labitte was in a nearby downtown area before the shooting occurred. He didn't hear about it until later that morning. I had like a ton of missed calls and texts with people just asking me like, you know, am I okay? You know, what, what, what's up if I'm good? Virgin Islander Yasin Hall, who's in Atlanta, recalled the horror she felt when she read the news on Facebook. Her two sons were in Orlando when the shooting happened. In Orlando, I didn't even read the rest. My mind just went, oh my God, my boy. Let me get in touch with my boys. What's going on with my boy? Just that the tensions were high. That people are um, contacting them and asking them how they're doing. They're contacting their friends and asking them how they're doing. They were scared. There was a sense of fear, like, you know, between the we're getting mixed reports from Virgin Islanders in Orlando as to what the atmosphere is like there now. Some say that people are coming together and praying for the victims and their families. Others say there's some negativity surrounding the fact that Orlando will now be known for the largest mass shooting in the history of the United States, while others say it's business as usual. The Orlando community did come out in force to donate blood to the victims of the tragedy. I know that um, the red buses, the blood, the blood donation buses, they're like, they're like actively driving around. The lines were packed trying to like donate blood because, um, you know, the people who did survive, they're in critical condition. A lot of them need blood and transfusion and stuff. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. Now, Governor Kenneth Mapp made this statement following the news. He says our thoughts and prayers are with the victims, their families, and the good people of the city of Orlando following the senseless tragedy that occurred there. Orlando is a city where many Virgin Islanders reside. Many young Virgin Islanders are attending school and pursuing careers in the city, while many of our seniors have relocated there to gain full access to their Medicare benefits at assisted living facilities and in-home medical services. Let us say a prayer for them in this most difficult and painful moment. He joined with President Obama and ordered that all flags be flown on local government facilities. Immediately was flown at half staff until sunset June 16th in memory of the victims of this brutal massacre. Meanwhile, an American-born man who'd pledged allegiance to ISIS gunned down 50 people early Sunday at the LGBT nightclub in Orlando, and this is the latest. It's, of course, the deadliest mass shooting being called the deadliest mass shooting in the United States and the nation's worst terror attack since 9-11. Diane Gallagher reports. The man who carried out the worst mass shooting in American history wanted to be a police officer. That's what his ex-wife says. But in their short marriage, Omar Mateen's ex-wife says he became violent. When he would get in his tempers, he would express hate toward things, toward everything. At the moment when you would see his emotional instability and turning totally different. And police say early Sunday morning, the 29-year-old opened fire inside an Orlando LGBT nightclub. Once people start screaming and shots just keep ringing out, you know that it's not a show anymore and you got to do what you got to do. Some trap sent frantic messages to friends and family for help. After several hours, SWAT team officers broke down a door of the club. <laughs> Officer shot Mateen dead. Mateen was an American living in Fort Pierce, Florida. Since 2007, he worked as a security officer. The FBI interviewed Mateen twice for potential ties to extremists, but those investigations were closed. During the shooting, Mateen called 911 to pledge allegiance to ISIS, something his neighbors find hard to believe. I mean, other than that, it seemed pretty normal to me. As the investigation continues, families desperately wait to hear any information on their loved ones caught in gunfire. You really can't describe it. I mean, you, you really can't, especially all the waiting waiting to find out if your son's okay. Um, it's, it's horrible. I don't wish this on anybody. In Orlando, I'm Diane Gallagher.
Turn our attention back at home. Meanwhile, over the weekend, shots also rang out in the Tutu area of St. Thomas, mirroring the violence in Orlando. On Sunday, two shootings claimed the lives of two young men and an injured, an injured one woman. The police department is preparing a statement on this latest spate of violent crime. News 2's April Knight has details. As Orlando tries to recover from Sunday's massacre, the Virgin Islands had its own bloody weekend. On Sunday morning, when the gunman started firing in Orlando, here on St. Thomas, shots were also fired in the area of Fort Milner. And then police found a four-door sedan at the bottom of Rapoon Hill. Inside was 34-year-old Jafari Samuel, who later died from his injuries. Also in the vehicle was a 26-year-old female. Both victims had been shot multiple times to their bodies and were transported to the Royal Lester Snyder Hospital for treatment. Mr. Jafari Samuel succumbed to his injuries at the hospital and was pronounced dead. The 26-year-old female is still receiving treatment for her injuries. And then on the same day at 3.30 in the afternoon, police found an unresponsive black man lying on the stairs of an apartment building in Hidden Valley. The man was pronounced dead on the scene by EMTs and transported to the Snyder Hospital morgue. The black male was positively identified as Ojania Atkins, 22 of Hidden Valley, by his next of kin. This case is presently under investigation by the Homicide Task Force. Anyone having information regarding this incident may contact the task force at 340-774-2211, extension 5617 and 5554. You can also call 911 or Crime Stoppers VI. The VIPD will also be holding a press conference on Tuesday to address the recent slew of gun violence. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. Be sure to tune in to News 2 on Tuesday for that press conference. Meanwhile, on Saturday, police say at approximately 3.23 a.m., officers were conducting a late-night enforcement initiative at a Christiansted nightclub, and it yielded an arrest. Here's more from the VIPD. Sir observed a male individual adjacent to him dropping an object which the officer perceived to be a receiver for a firearm. Upon further investigation, Mr. Akil Santiago of Sencoy was arrested for possession of firearm and narcotics. Mr. Santiago was arrested in March 2015 for assault first, but trial date is still pending. On Saturday, June 11th at 8.30 p.m., 32-year-old Mr. Ossi Constant was arrested for robbery first. Mr. Constant was a suspect in a robbery that took place on the Christiansted Boardwalk Thursday evening. Around 4.43 p.m., Mr. Constant was unable to post bail and transported to the Golden Grove Detention Center awaiting his advice to rights hearing. Well, on Sunday at 1.59 a.m., officers made a traffic stop on North Shore Road. During the process, officers observed a narcotic substance inside the vehicle. Upon further investigation, they say a firearm was discovered. The driver of that vehicle, 29-year-old Aaron Lynch, was arrested for possession of an unlicensed firearm and narcotics. Mr. Lynch, unable to post bail, was taken to the Golden Grove Detention Center. Well, employee morale at the Bureau of Corrections is on the rise, they say, as a result of recent salary increases authorized by Governor Kenneth Mapp and other efforts to better train and equip staff. BOC Director Rick Mulgrave reported this. BOC officers were among thousands of GBI employees, government employees, granted raises by Governor Mapp this year. The corrections officers saw these raises reflected in their June 9th paychecks. And as well, raises are retroactive to January 1st, 2016. They can also look forward to getting a lump sum for back pay later this month. The administration has reported that the raises for government workers average about $5,000 annually. On Friday, we reported on a report by the Inspector General on the alleged overpayment to the Dima Law Firm in the South Shore contamination lawsuit. In the report, we stated that the firm took out $17.9 million in charges out of the $27.9 million in settlement. Representatives of the Dima Law Firm contacted News 2 and stressed that the settlement amount was actually $67.9 million. This is correct. The 27.9 figure, however, we repeated throughout the Inspector General's report and could be accounted for in this chart, which indicates $27.9 million in settlement received and 40. 
million that had not yet been collected. Together, they total 67.9 million. So to clarify, the law firm collected 17.9 million out of the 27.9 million in collected settlement amount. In September, they will go into arbitration with the VI government for an additional 10 million that the law firm claims the government owes them. Count on two to keep you updated. Well, keeping our eye on the economy, let's take a look at the stock market watch at the New York Stock Exchange. According to the numbers there, we can see everything down. The Dow 132, NASDAQ 46, S&P 500 also down at 17. Coming up on News 2, we have some hurricane tip reminders for innovative customers. Plus, numerous graduation ceremonies took place over the weekend. We'll share some of those highlights with you. Welcome back. Innovative, the leading telecommunications provider in the territory, reminds its employees and customers that in the event of a severe storm or hurricane, it is important that they tune to local radio and television stations to stay abreast of weather conditions and updates from the company. Sean F. O'Donnell, CEO and president of the Innovative Companies, shares some reminders. Here's more. Good day. This is Sean O'Donnell, CEO of Innovative, here to remind you about important hurricane preparedness activities. In the event of a storm, customers should refrain from cutting down or moving any down lines because they may be active utility lines. For customers on our new network, during a power outage, the backup battery for your modem will provide up to six hours of talk time. We encourage you to use your telephone on an as needed basis during power outages to conserve the battery life. We know that there are customers whose batteries no longer hold a charge, and we have been contacting these customers directly to replace these batteries free of charge. These customers can bring these batteries to the business office to swap out their dead battery, or if you are not able to or unwilling to remove the battery yourself, you can call 912 to schedule an appointment for Innovative to come to your house to swap it out for you. Either way is free of charge to our customers. And as you're aware, we are in the hurricane season. Meanwhile, the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority is in the process of building out the automated metering infrastructure system. They say a key component of AMI is the new smart meters. You've been seeing these advertisements. The authority began the process of changing customers' electrical meters to the smart meter in 2014 and is currently 90% complete in the St. Thomas St. John district and 75% complete on St. Croix. They say overall benefits of the new meters are accuracy, reliability, and convenience. They say with the new meters, there is a heightened security of the system and severe implications for persons who tamper with the electrical meters. Therefore, customers or electricians are not authorized to remove WAPA seals or meters without applying for a tag and meter removal at the business office, nor authorized to disconnect or reconnect service weatherheads. On Monday morning, the Juan Louis Hospital on St. Croix sent out notice that the hospital's management and staff received an inspection team from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, on Sunday. According to the hospital, it's an opportunity for Juan Louis to demonstrate to the agency that the hospital provides quality patient care on a daily basis. We will keep you updated on the results of the inspections should the hospital or CMS release them. Graduation ceremonies were in full swing this past weekend. 35 students are now proud graduates of the Antilles School class of 2016. The valedictorian was Amanda Engerman. The salutatorian was Paige Clark. Total scholarships grants awarded almost $5 million. The students were accepted to over 140 different schools, including Yale, Wake Forest, Hofstra University, and more. Many well-wishers, family members were in the audience. Many of the students added their personal style when it came to uh, actually receiving the diplomas from conch shell blowing to confettis to styling and profiling. The guest speaker was Cornell Williams of ICMC who shared words of wisdom 
with members of the class. I would like to say a special congratulations to my son, Tasman Dior McGrath, one of the graduates, honor student. Tasman also received a four-year scholarship to Johnson & Wales University in Miami and received a Pride, Guts and Determination Athletic Award. Congratulations to all the graduates. Meanwhile, St. Thomas St. John Adult Education and Family Literacy Center awarded 38 adult continuing diplomas and 14 GED certificates at the CAHS Auditorium. The valedictorian was Catherine Jules and the salutatorian, 17-year-old Shailen Smith. Each gave their stories about perseverance and determination. The center offers both adult continuing education program and a GED high school equivalency certification program. Congratulations to all the graduates. And finally, the St. Croix Seven-Day Adventist Schools commencement ceremony occurred on Saturday at the Complex Auditorium. 16 graduates proudly claimed their diplomas. The valedictorian, Julianne Eck, was also the youngest in the class. She will be attending UVI for three years, then finishing up at Boston University. By the way, she would have earned a bachelor's in applied math and a master's in civil engineering. Erlin Ravier was class laudatorian. She has already started studying biology and psychology at UVI. The class has been offered awards and scholarships totaling $466,000. Congratulations to all the graduates. Be sure to stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next.